Hi, everybody, and welcome to Lincoln College. For our third Lincoln Leads, this is Lincoln Leads in Medicine, and we have a wonderful guest today who is really going to be very, very interesting and has a very unique point of view to present. Uh, I'm Alan Garfinkel. I'm the Newton Abraham Visiting Professor at Lincoln for the year and loving it. And our guest, who will tell you about himself, is um, here with us to tell us about his experiences in Jamaica, as well as other places. So David, Dr. David Walcott, um, hi. <laughs> hi, Alan. <laughs> Thank you for, for the, the mic. Uh, uh, greetings to all the uh, Lincolnites. Um, I myself was a Lincolnite uh, a few years ago and I'm still one at heart. Uh, I'm here now in Jamaica just to share a bit about myself. Um, right now, I am the uh, co-chair of the steering committee, um, the COVID steering committee led by the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers Community. Um, and the sort of background to that was, you know, a medical doctor by background. While I was at Lincoln a few years ago, did my um, master's and PhD in immunology. And so uh, I've been working on public health since. And so naturally when COVID had started, I had I'd become very busy uh, culminating in this sort of role with the World Economic Forum. So glad to be here today and share a bit about, you know, my perspective and what we're doing in this global fight. So you, you may be the best person in the world to ask this question. <laughs> um, if you look at the different countries' experiences, they have just varied wildly from country to country, wildly. Absolutely. What, in your experience, what are the key factors that explain this, this wild variation from one country to another? Uh, you know, that's a, I feel like several PhDs could be written on that. Uh, but what I would say is there are two main buckets that come to mind. So I think, I think the quality of healthcare overall, just in terms of um, the uh, extent and capacity of healthcare services, as well as the health outcomes would be sort of one bucket. And then the other bucket I'd place the social determinants of health, right, which which, which, which I think are, you know, a, an important and uh, emerging aspect of healthcare that we're starting to speak more about. Um, if you look at countries that have traditionally uh, high quality healthcare systems and, and the metrics for this usually are things like infant mortality rate, et cetera, those countries um, clearly with some exceptions have tended to be, to experience, you know, relatively, um, you know, good outcomes in, in, in COVID as shown by COVID mortality, particularly among groups that can afford to access this healthcare. Uh, whereas, you know, looking at, you know, social determinants of health, collectively speaking, looking at the impact of, of, of sex, gender, um, occupation, uh, you know, levels of wealth, etc. cetera, it, it's been very clear that the uh, outcomes of COVID infection have been um, significantly uh, worse in, in, in these sort of underprivileged populations. Um, so those are the two sort of main buckets I would, I see as really driving the disparities in, in health outcomes. Naturally, I think there are a few sort of black swan, black card um, variables as well. Leadership is, is, is one a really big one that has stood out to me because you could, you know, you could have a very high powered healthcare system and you could have a wealthy population, but if the leadership is unable to, to, to um, connect the um, you know, patients who need healthcare to the uh, healthcare resources, you're gonna have um, suboptimal outcomes. And a second factor that has sort of emerged over time is uh, in populations that have a very high level of, <clears throat> I would say civic discipline, um, many of which are in the far East, we've seen much better outcome uh, because there's a, a pardon me that's a great concept civic discipline civic discipline yeah uh, go but, on sorry i love it and, and i think it sort of dovetails into leadership because the 
if you flip the leadership coin, the other side of leadership is civic discipline, the extent to which the populace adheres to the uh, you know, doctrines or, or the you know, uh, mandate as, it, as suggested by the leader. And in, in ecosystems where there's a high level of you know, civic discipline and, and strong leadership, we've seen where outcomes have been relatively good. And most of the Far Eastern states, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, have, have, have very good examples of that. You were saying uh, the, the quality of the healthcare system is a prime determinant. And I wanted to quibble with you and, and say, I have four letters for you, sir. U.S. and U.K. <laughs> as very advanced healthcare systems where they haven't delivered spectacular results on COVID. And as a matter of fact, I think the U.S. and the U.K. are the two worst countries to be in right now. Yeah, so there are two, there are two things that come to mind in, in response to that. I think having, <clears throat> having access to having high quality healthcare services present within an ecosystem does not necessarily equate to having those services available to the population en masse. Uh -huh. so, so I think in as much as the US and UK certainly um, have uh, you know, you know, well-resourced healthcare systems <clears throat> at the higher end of the scale, I don't think such resources are available <laughs> to, to the majority of the population, which is why for example, in the, youth, in the US, um, healthcare outcomes are relatively suboptimal compared to spending. Um, and so I think that has been one sort of critical factor that explains you know, the, the, the disparities we've seen. And secondly, to compound this um, point, the challenge with COVID is not so much a problem of uh, immediate sort of mortality per infection. The challenge with COVID is because it spreads so rapidly, and it progresses so quickly. Uh, one of the main challenges health health sectors face is the sheer volume of of, of, of cases. And so, if you know you have a hospital or a healthcare system that has a cap ICU capacity of five percent, and you normally operate at two percent, but all of a sudden you're flooded to 10, 20 percent that's at least 15% of individuals who are unable to get the care they need. And that number just continues ballooning, which is what we've seen in the US and UK, which is where leadership is important. So apparently you've done fairly well in Jamaica. What's, what's the secret sauce? Uh, there are many theories for what the secret sauce looks like in Jamaica, which, which I won't go into, <laughs> um, but you know, I would say, I would say, in terms of COVID, uh, our outcomes have have been relatively have been relatively good. And again, I'm offering my hypotheses. Um, one is we were were tropical, and viruses have been collect overall shown to be to have sort of shorter shelf lives in in, in the tropics. That's one. Two were an island which means it's relatively easy to control our borders. Um, three, we're a small island. So contact tracing is, is relatively confined. Um, and so we were able to implement rapid contact tracing. Uh, we were able to close our borders relatively early. Um, and I think quite frankly, we demonstrated a strong level of leadership from you know, the sort of um, gatekeepers of healthcare, both in the public and private sector. We sort of align very quickly around a narrative that served the entire country. And, and so I think all of those things together have made us fare well in terms of our sheer case numbers. Now, in terms of our case mortality, um, again, it, it just so happened that because we were, were able to manage the rate of infection, um, the, the caseload did not exceed the capacity of our ICU services to, to resource. And so we had managed to keep our, mort our, our mortality rates low, one and two. We, we don't have as high, a, um, I would say vulnerable population as other states. Um, you know, for example, 
uh, Guyana and Trinidad, which have a much larger East Indian population and have um, higher incidence of cardiovascular disease, they've seen um, you know, case fatality rates of maybe five to six X that of Jamaica. So we've oh. done pretty well for, for, for those reasons. So five and six X is due to the presence of comorbidity, you say? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, because what COVID does in, in um, I guess, in, in, in simple terms related to mortality and morbidity is what it does is it decreases the capacity of your, of, of your lungs to provide oxygen to your tissue. So if you have, pre, if you have pre-existing cardiovascular or cardiopulmonary disease, um, what it does is you already have a reduced uh, cardiopulmonary capacity. And when, that is, when COVID is compounded upon it, um, it increases your chances of, of, of mortality. So, so it's interesting. The rest of the Caribbean has not had as spectacular a success as Jamaica. Is that fair to I, say? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. I think the Caribbean collectively has been quite fortunate in, in this COVID fight. One, because of you know, responding early, and two, because we're islands and we've managed to sort of safeguard our borders very quickly. Um, uh, I would say the majority of the, the majority of the Caribbean islands have been relatively judicious in their management of COVID, especially the small islands to our, to our east, like the, you know, the Barbados, the St. Lucia's, etc. They've all been very good. I think the only island that has had a significant challenge with COVID management has been um, the Hispaniola, uh, DR and Haiti, um, and Guyana has had recent challenges with, with keeping their mortality rates down, but on a, on a case basis, the, the case loads have, have really not been as wildly um, significant as they could. I see. Moving along, it, uh, a lot of us have been interested in the role of information and information transmission and information transmission channels. I, I have even heard the phrase infodemic to describe the, uh, the excuse me, viral propagation of information that people are using to guide their behaviors. What has that, and, and just viewing this in general, there's been good information. There's also been an awful lot of misinformation, maybe more misinformation than good information. What's your, what's your take on that? And, and have you been able to get on top of those channels in Jamaica? Uh, well, so I, I fully agree with you, first of all. I think, in fact, one of the first things we had said was we really have two pandemics on our hand. We have a pandemic, a viral pandemic, a coronavirus <clears throat> pandemic, and we have a, a viral pandemic of misinformation. Um, and in many cases, we saw where, where the levels of panic were spreading much faster than the, than the virus itself. Um, because just as it is for the news, um, uh, where, where sort of bad news is, is, is more attractive to be covered than good news, uh, misinformation is always a little bit more attractive than, than accurate information for some reason. And we, it was the first challenge that we had sought to solve. And by we, this wasn't so much a Jamaican effort as it was a World Economic Forum Global Shapers community effort. Uh, we, we ultimately have a community of uh, 10,000 uh, young people <clears throat> in just about 400 cities spread out across the globe. Uh, and you know, these young people are innovators, thought leaders. Um, you know, some are medical doctors, some engineers, some immunologists, some work with the WHO. So a bunch of, I would say, relatively well-placed individuals um, in, in these grassroots community and or, or thought was, and by or I mean the steering, the COVID steering committee, or thought was to 
to see how best we could play a role in the in the fight against COVID. And how we viewed our role was almost as a distribution channel. We are not qualified to create information. The, the WHO is qualified to create information. The CDC is qualified to create information. But what we have that they don't necessarily have in our capacity is an extensive distribution network of individuals who are boots on the ground in cities around the, <clears throat> around the globe. Distribution of what? Distribution of information. So what we would have done is we would have partnered with the WHO um, and the United Nations to distribute their um, vetted information and, and sort of serve as ambassadors of, of trusted, vetted, verified information, which is the first thing we did. And ultimately, we, we managed to reach, in our first campaign, which was the Prevention Over Panic campaign, we managed to reach just about 70 countries within 24 hours. So it was, the first problem we sought to solve for was misinformation. So you were talking about your, your task being the prevention of panic. It, There's yes. another side to that coin, which is almost that you want to create a certain amount of, I don't want to say panic, of but of course. Uh, concerned yes. reaction. Of course. And that's a good point you made. I mean, or what we thought, what we sought for our sort of campaign was not necessarily to prevent panic, but to focus on prevention over focusing on panic. So, so you know, channel your energies towards wearing your mask or towards washing your hands or towards, you know, practicing these sort of risk mitigating behaviors as opposed to sort of, sort of being held in this um, cloak of panic, which um, while, you know, a certain level of responsible panic is encouraged, um, too much panic can really thwart your efforts to, you exactly. know, to, 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 to really manage the, the risk. Did you have a lot of crazy pseudo medicine circulating? Oh, there, was, there was absolutely a lot, especially, especially in Jamaica. I mean, we, uh, we, we were a very sort of, um, I would say, we're a relatively low income country. And so there is a lot of sort of alternative medicine permeating. And um, one of the big things that we had to deal with on the ground was just educating the population as to what, you know, first of all, what, what works against COVID and what is not proven to work, including things like, you know, uh, green tea, including, <clears throat> including things like, you know, washing your hands in olive oil, I mean, there are so many different things that we sought to disambiguate. Um, uh, but, but also I found that, you know, when you're operating within relatively closed environments, echo chambers can form where the same sort of misconceptions are, are reverberate and, and gain a life of their own. And so it was very difficult to um, just communicate in, in no uncertain terms uh, what has not been shown to work in COVID-19. And that's where the government really stepped in and um, made uh -huh. their sort of mandate very clear. So, uh, by the way, let me interrupt myself. Um, folks out there, if you have questions, here is your chance to ask David Wall's question. So just type it into the text box and we will pose it to him. Uh, so did you, you did not, or you did, I guess you did see a lot of social media erupting immediately that the virus hit and that was going in all kinds of directions. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 the, the levels of misinformation were. I mean, it, it was quite frankly overwhelming. And the first thing I thought when I saw the um, tsunami of, of social media posts coming my way was, okay, this is, this is transforming uh, an immunological pandemic into a mental health pandemic, because there is no way that a human being can tolerate being subjected to such, um, you know, su such quantities of, of uh, unpleasant information. 
Um, and so we had actually written to Ariana Huffington's post, Thrive Global. Um, and there's an article which I can share with the team afterwards um, that we had written just sort of stating that we should all beware for the second pandemic, which is a mental health pandemic. Mm. Um, first, the first thing I had thought when I had seen the extent of you know, viral and vigorous social media activity around COVID-19 was we're not, we're not understanding how this is gonna affect our, our long-term uh, mental state. And what kinds of effects do you see on our long-term mental state? Uh, I mean, I think I'm going to frame it as the sort of problems and, and the opportunities, because I think, I think the first thing that we need to all be aware of is how this pandemic has affected us, right? Both in tangible and, and intangible ways. So, you know, there is the loss of income for, for, you know, for a significant number. There's a loss of food security for perhaps an even larger number. Um, there is the idea of being quarantined and we're all social creatures. Um, loneliness has been, has been scientifically, and I'd be hard pressed to quote the study, but has been shown to be in some, it, at some scales as severe as, as harmful as smoking, because it, you know- In heart disease, in my field, in heart disease, definitely. Absolutely. There you go. There go you go. The birth of the expert, <laughs> right? So it, it's been shown to be as harmful, significantly harmful, um, where, you know, social creatures. And in addition, when you compound one being, being overstimulated with um, panic um, driving information and the practical aspects of having to deal with the uh, consequences and the repercussions of COVID-19, wherein perhaps you have a family member who has passed on and you're unable to, to really undergo the um, rituals that you normally would um, in response to, 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 to their mm -hmm. mortality. Many people have died and we've been able to sort of have proper, you know, goodbyes. We've been unable, we've been unable to have funerals. And so all of these things compounded, I think, create a, um, an environment for, um, you know, mental illness to, to really spew. But I think the opportunity is on the other side of the coin, mental health, because everyone's mental state will, will be somewhat challenged. There is an injunction on us to realize that this is an opportunity to, to relate to the masses, because this is perhaps um, the point in time in which, um, the global world will be most receptive to, to engaging with mental health and engaging in proactive means of, of That's interesting. preserving mental wellness. So yeah. you really see an opportunity here to do some expansion, to expand the good and not just minimize the bad. Of course, absolutely, absolutely. Because I think the challenge with mental health is that people don't see it. And so it's, it's this sort of obscure, intangible, um, you know, in, in, invisible demon that you, you don't quite know until you know it. Well, now everybody is, is getting acquainted with it uh, because we're all locked up by ourselves with our own thoughts and individuals who perhaps had not given any level of credence to mental illness are now, rec are now forced to reckon with the idea of their mental state decomposing. And so it creates a, a vacuum in which the, the globe can really have a meaningful conversation around mental health. That, that's a fascinating take on the situation. I like it. It's giving us something to look forward to. As a matter of fact, as, as you're talking about, so to speak, the psychology of the illness and of people's responses to the illness, we're dealing here in the UK <laughs> with a little psychiatric issue, which is people, I don't wanna, uh, certain people don't want to wear masks. And I'm gonna name names. According to the Guardian today, it's younger and middle-aged white guys. Don't flipping want to wear masks. And so mask, uh, or face covering, 
uh, utilization on the trains is running 20%. What's up with this? <laughs> what? I, you're not a psychiatrist, I know that. No. What are I, these people thinking? <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I, I, do, I can only hypothesize and maybe my hypothesis is skewed based on your description of the demographic. Um, it may be, it may be a consequence of, and I, per, this is not my space at all, but I'm just hypothesizing out loud. It may be the consequence of privilege, quite frankly, because if, if you, if you, if you imagine that you are privileged to a certain extent, there's a, there's a, you haven't been able to develop a relationship with, with risk, <clears throat> um, uh, and and consequence rather a relationship with consequence and so it may be the case that because the whatever um, social or health systems are in place have managed to serve this population um, as, serve their needs they don't quite perceive the risks generated by by, by COVID as being real whereas individuals who have had to face um, I suppose health disparities for, for a long time coming are acutely aware of, of the need to prevent disease um, apart from cure. You know, that, that, that is my hypothesis. It may have to, it may be related to being sort of um, in, a, in a state of privilege. And I, I could say this as a medical doctor as well, because um, there are also cases where, you know, medical doctors are, medical doctors make the worst patients. You know, it's commonly said. And a part of that is because we are, we have a sort of false sense of security um, because, because we're privileged from a healthcare perspective. We, 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 we have a deeper understanding um, of you know, health risks, et cetera, and it gives us a false sense of security. And I think it may be a, a, a similar sort of phenomenon in, in that population. It's really interesting. I think it's only been in the past couple of years that we have seen the subject of risk psychology and risk management and risk cognition become seriously studied. I, I just saw an article a couple of weeks ago that said that uh, Parkinson patients have impaired risk assessment. And I thought, ooh, that's very interesting that a neurological defect could be that pinpoint, so to speak, that it lesions or attacks whatever is going on in the brain that makes, that, that enables us to weigh risks. For example, how much we rate positive outcomes against the probability of negative outcomes. And I, I, I'm fascinated by this literature. It's all brand new. And I, I, I think there has to be a lot more of that no, I, uh, in the sense very, of understanding how people approach risk. No, I think that's very interesting. Um, well, you know, one of the things we always, we don't say it, but in, in these words, but I think it could be said that entrepreneurs, it, it like, individuals with Parkinson's, entrepreneurs have a, a, a faulty risk radar, right? Because, you know, we, we, we tend to be a little bit too risk tolerant. Um, and, and it- A little be, too risk what? A little bit too risk tolerant. Uh, and, you know, it could be, it, it, it's interesting to see the ways in which this intangible entity called our mind works with this tangible entity called our brain, <laughs> right? It's, it's very interesting. So I have, I actually have a feeling that there's going to be a, this is going to grow that subject mm -hmm. and we're going to see a lot more attention to that because I'm out walking in the park in my mask and 20 somethings runners are unmasked, ungarmented, pushing past me. Like, what is your problem? Of course, of course, of course. And I, I guess that's a young person's at it. You know, young people are famously unable to account for downside risks. Of 
course. <clears throat> but yeah. Especially in a, in a world, I think we're, because we're so over because what in, in at, a, at a very high level, um, your, your perception of risk can somewhat be tied to your ability to, um, to, to, to link a, a cause with an effect, right? And in, mm -hmm. in so doing, you sort of form this calculation around risk, whereas because things are moving in such, because we're operating in such in a society where things are so fast moving, it may be more difficult to draw that line between cause and effect or appreciate that relationship between cause and effect in such a fast paced world and, and, and so it would be interesting to explore the extent to which our evolving society um, has been eroding our ability to, to, appreciate, to appreciate risk. That's very interesting, because just as you were talking, I was thinking, well, you know, it, it, what you're saying is right. It's, it's one thing to talk about smoking and cancer. If you smoke, you increase your risk of cancer by some gigantic some, but it's not quite the same thing with this, because as you said, this is multifactorial. Whether you come down with COVID is a question of who you happen to be standing near, how many people happen to be there, what their background was. And the, the smoker cannot try to convince himself that it depends upon what brand of cigarettes I'm smoking or where I'm smoking them or how many people are in the room when I'm smoking cigarettes. It's real simple, smoking causes cancer. And I, and I think just what you said, there's a much weaker, hard association of cause and effect in this case. And you can say, well, it's multifactorial. So I guess I just have to take my chances. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's it's easy to just sort of not hold yourself accountable, and I think, I I think it would be interesting to really dive deep into the sociological changes that are accounting for this risk psychology as well. Um, yeah. You know, one, the fast-paced society, and two, the fact that as a society, certainly in the West, we're becoming a lot more individualized, right? At, at many levels, we have we're becoming more of a sort of self-sufficient, self-actualizing. We're becoming self-actualizing entities as opposed to communal entities, right? And it's 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 taking place on a on an individual scale and on a national scale, which is why nationalism is on the rise and insularity is on the rise, etc. It's we're we're becoming overall more narcissistic as a species. And if you think about that in relation to risk um, and your ability to appreciate risk, it may compromise your ability to one learn from observing the cause effect. Um, outside of your immediate reality. So, you know, it compromises your ability to see someone <clears throat> experience a cause <clears throat> and an effect on one hand. And on the other hand, it may erode your level of concern for, you know, passing the virus on and having your cause serve as someone else's effect. It's a really interesting space to explore. Yeah, I think, I think psychology of risk is gonna be a huge subject, theoretical and applied. Let me, let me shift the focus a second because there's a, a, a lingering question that, that I and I think a lot of other people have. And this is about the social dealing, the, the organizational administrative dealing with the, with the epidemic. You yourself have stressed, obviously very correctly, the importance of testing. And you read all of the studies of stuff that say, oh, testing is key, testing is very important. Why have we done so badly at this? This is, this is probably the worst single aspect of our social response is yeah. a lack of effective testing. Yeah, I think, well, I, I, again, I, to, to fully agree with you, testing is important. To, to solve a problem, you have to see the problem. <laughs> and to see the problem, you have to, you have to have concrete evidence, right? And so um, I think we've done badly for several reasons. I think Again, we're dealing with the first pandemic in 100 years. Um, and there, so there are no experts, 
So even individuals or people who've studied pandemics, you know, the last pandemic in 1918, a pandemic in 1918 is different from a pandemic in 2020. Uh -huh. so, so there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no manual for managing this. And I think we've been sort of figuring it, figuring it out as we've, we've gone along. And by we, I mean, government, private entities, public entities, the third sector and the, the citizenry, we've all been sort of trying to figure things out. Um, and we, we, the influencers and the key decision makers um, tended to not be the healthcare experts. And, and so it uh -huh. took some time for that sort of, for, for, for the transfer of that knowledge and that urgency to be, um, I suppose, evangelized by the key decision makers, one. Two, on a, on a less, I suppose on a more objective basis, one of the challenges with testing is, again, being able to do so at scale. Um, be, you know, because- uh, you scale. Expect, absolutely. To do so at scale because you need a very large distribution network um, to do so. And only a few countries have figured that out, more so in the Far East. And in part, they have had practice because they have been subjected to several um, epidemics uh, before, SARS, uh, MERS, et cetera. So they've, they've been sort of relatively practiced in how to conduct testing very quickly. Two and three, the test that has to be used for uh, a diagnosis of COVID is the PCR test, which um, actually looks for the DNA. Looking for the antibodies cannot distinguish between current infection and previous infection. And so because we're dependent on this PCR test, which is pretty labor intensive to do, um, and I would say very significantly skill dependent, um, it's created an additional bottleneck in the entire testing process. <clears throat> can, can PCR be made available at population scale? Uh, mm, I think it, I, I, I think it can, but there are certain things that would have to be solved. You'd have to solve for making it easier to do, um, therein decentralizing it. And two, you'd have to solve for making it faster to do. Um, no, it, it, it never will be able to be done at a doctor's office. <clears throat> but if you can solve for the ease of doing PCR and the speed of doing PCR, the time taken to do PCR, um, you can actually you can actually significantly increase your throughput at a lab. <clears throat> and if you have a matching distribution network, it's very much feasible for uh, you know, PCRs to be done at scale. Now, where is that infrastructure going to come from? Because I, pers I was watching TV one night, watching the prime minister's daily COVID conference and there was an, he had an epidemiologist up there. And uh, the question from the audience was, uh, why haven't the scientists done better with testing, having a better testing program? And the retort came back, hey, that's not a medical, doctors and scientists don't design mass testing programs. Course, that's really somewhere else. Of course, of course, of course. And I, I, I personally think that we need in this post COVID environment and waiting for the next COVID, which is definitely coming, um, we are gonna need to have a new type of agency to play this role of uh, standing up a, a, a testing program for 20 million people in the next two weeks. That's not something doctors know how to do. <laughs> yeah, it's not, they, they, they don't teach that in medical school yet. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and, and that is where learning from our friends in the Far East is useful because they've had, they've had, they've simply had to do it to, to, to prevent what was an, an endemic um, that transformed into an epidemic a few years ago, um, you know, SARS and, and, and MERS, uh, they've, had to, they've had to develop protocols for mass testing. And 
I think what the West could have done a little bit better is to consult with these experts. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. They actually had a bigger problem than we did, and therefore they had to solve it. They had to solve it several times over. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and we kind of didn't. And SARS and MERS did not have the mortality and morbidity impact. Therefore, we said, okay, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. No worries. But that's not true. So I think I think that's a direction we're going to have to be going in. They've been well, they've been very well practiced in the Far East. They've been very well practiced in mass testing, and they've developed technological tools that are just now being recognized as solutions by, I would say, the the global West. So it is hoped that you know with the next pandemic, um, you know, uh, you know, we'll be a lot, we'll be much better prepared, and there'll be a greater level of um, cross pollination of, of best practices from 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 the pandemic or epidemic experts, so to speak. Cool. We have a very interesting question from one of our viewers. Um, has the role of the physician changed? Has the role of the physician changed? Um, the, the demands of the physician have certainly changed. Uh, I wouldn't quite say the role of the physician. I'm, I'm trying to sharpen that question in my mind because it's, it's, there's so many ways in which it could go. Um, I mean, we're, the, the onus on the physician is, is always to provide healthcare and not do harm. Um, and, and I think COVID has really tested or, tested or, or, or fibers. Uh, we've been called upon in a way that we've never been called upon before, analogous to sort of going to war. Uh, many physicians have given their lives in this fight. Um, I, and I think, I don't think the role of the physician has changed from our perspective, apart from being sort of extremely stressed out. But I think the role of the physician as seen by society has, has been strengthened. We're no longer sort of just seen as, um, uh, you know, uh, healthcare robots that are simply, you know, <clears throat> that simply should serve a role in, in, in an altruistic role in society, right? We're, we're seen as, as agents that are really guardians of, 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 of the healthcare of humanity. And I think that that's an important, it will represent an important um, uh, turning point for the level of investment going into healthcare from this point onwards. <clears throat> The, um, here's, a, here's an interesting question. David, what have you learned from the pandemic that will improve your collaborative efforts? Because it seems as like a lot of your work focuses on networks and creating organizations. Why is this so important? Uh, well, I think I can give you a short answer and I can give you a colorful answer. Oh, I'm, I'm trying oh, to oh please, the colorful one. I'm just trying to find a line of best fit. Um, no, the, the truth is a, 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 product, a product is only as good as the extent to which it's connected to a market, <clears throat> right? And we typically view products as tangible, but products can be information, right? It, 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 it can be an idea, it can be a concept. And it's very difficult for things to grow and to thrive without being nurtured in a holistic environment. And so one of the key factors, just sort of going into my personal um, background that I saw was the importance of sort of being surrounded by the right people, not necessarily in a transactional sense, but in a sense where I could meaningfully contribute um, and who I felt like could meaningfully contribute to me. <clears throat> and I've sort of deliberately, I to, to add a bit of, I guess, background to my story, I opted to bypass a career in, in, in the corporate world. So I opted to bypass a career in management consulting um, because I felt like it was a fantastic career path to go down, <clears throat> but, but I felt like it would, it would have been a little bit too slow for me in terms of <clears throat> being able to move from <clears throat> doing what I would consider sort of basic corporate functions <clears throat> and really make decisions 
I felt like consulting, like working at a McKinsey was very good for, um, you know, <clears throat> building credibility, building networks and building knowledge. And I felt like I could build, I could build knowledge on my own. I could, proactively seek to build networks. And if those two are in place, <clears throat> the um, credibility will come. And so I've sought to deliberately sort of build uh, my networks. Uh, I've, I do a lot of work with the World Economic Forum, um, with Rhodes, um, Rhodes Trust as well. <clears throat> uh, and it's given me a very high level of access, I suppose, into different corners of the world. And so you never quite realize the importance of these networks until they require, until they need to be activated. When I was at, this is a little story about Lincoln. When I was at Lincoln, actually, I picked up a series of foreign languages just by talking to different um, students in the MCR. Hmm. I had some French friends, German friends, Portuguese friends, and I'd pick up their languages until I was conversational. And, uh, you know, I, I never realized the importance of that until this COVID fight where I had to be you know, on the phone with, um, you know, uh, leadership in Geneva um, or, or, or leadership in, in Brazil. And so I would say always sort of, it's, it's important to overinvest in relationships because you never know when they'll um, be, be called upon. So for, in particular, when, when COVID-21 hits a year or so from now, are you, do you have, are you going to be, do you have a Rolodex? Do you, are you going to be able to activate a network to make a response? Well, this, so the thing is, I, I would, I would certainly try. Um, right now, what we're doing is we're seeing where there are, there are several sort of large healthcare networks, right? That, you know, large organizations that have their sort of network following WHO, et cetera. Um, we, through the World Economic Forum, again, have a series of health initiatives uh, that have, you know, driven impact um, in the public sector, the private sector, and that really embraces a multi-stakeholder collaborative approach. And it is something I want to carry into any sort of major, any major problem I'm solving. Um, you know, I, I generally uh, perceive a large part of the problem solving to be dependent on the engagement of multiple stakeholders. And that's something that you actively try to put together. Uh, absolutely, because we had to give you another um, more context. One of the businesses that our company runs is a, it, 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 it's a, a community managing business where we essentially host the, the Davos of the Caribbean. That is what we sort of call mm -hmm. it. Um, I mean, it, it convenes a significant amount of wealth in the region. We, you know, at our last conference, we had a room that, a room of individuals managing over a hundred billion US dollars um, in, in the Caribbean. And that sort of capital doesn't necessarily come into the region very often. And overall, the community has seeded over just about 300 million US dollars into the region. And in, in building that community um, as, as a founding partner, um, I realized that it was very important to be able to add fuel to solutions that were being proposed. And in many cases, what a sort of strong and powerful network can do is it can add fuel that allows for solutions to really be materialized. And so we've built that investment community in the Caribbean. We've built a tech community in the Caribbean. We, we now have the largest tech conference in the Caribbean. And wow. we're, looking, we're looking at building a healthcare community that essentially does the same thing? So the answer is yes. <laughs> Here's a, a whole bunch of questions from, from viewers. Um, as you know, certainly, uh, the prime minister recently announced easing of the lockdown here. Uh, but the R number, is still 0.7 to 0.9, is edging close to one. I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you personally think this is a wise move to, to relax lockdown at this point? Yeah. Or is it something we have to do? So, so I think it, it, it has to be done, but I think it has to be done intelligently. I don't think, I don't think a general lockdown relaxes the, is the optimal solution. I think just in terms of 
giving an easy answer. We could look at somewhere like Sweden, right? Mm -hmm. Sweden did not implement extremely strict lockdown measures universally. They were very strict about lockdown of vulnerable populations. No, that was a, it turned out to be a pretty wise move because what it means is that you are um, essentially permitting the non-vulnerable to be infected and develop immunity, which then prevents them from, from carrying the virus to the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're using, you're creating almost a human shield around the vulnerable by um, applying rigorous lockdown measures to the vulnerable and allowing and, and minimal lockdown measures to the um, young and, 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 and strong. And so um, I think any sort of lockdown measures that are implemented, um, you know, whether it be in the UK, the US, etc., should really seek to learn from that model and seek to drive herd immunity within the non-vulnerable. You know, I, I can honestly say I haven't really heard that clear an analysis. And it, it just seems to make total sense <laughs> to me <laughs> hearing, hearing you say it. Um, here's an interesting question, which is the question of civil liberties. What, what do you think is the healthiest relationship between emergency needs and civil liberties? I haven't heard too much of this in the UK. Of course, in the US, you're hearing a lot of it about our freedom to go to the beach is being yeah. compromised by these doctors. Yeah. Um, what is the role of civil um, liberties here in your opinion? I'm just trying to think how I would answer it. Um, it, it's, it so what, what it brings to mind this statement by Winston Churchill, and I may be misquoting him, but um, democracy is the worst type of government, um, except for all others. Right. Right. So, so it, it, it ultimately, when you're looking at that tension between individual rights and the rights of the community <clears throat> it's very difficult <clears throat> to sort of straddle that line in baseline circumstances and even more so in a pandemic um i don't think <clears throat> i don't think that and, and i'm just trying to articulate what's in my head i don't think the solution is a specific point um at which there is a certain balance of civil liberties and let's say authoritarian um, uh, dicta. I don't think there's a specific point. What I think, I think the optimal um, relationship is for those things to constantly be in tension. <clears throat> I, I, think it's, I think it's more important that those two things are in, in a constant state of tension, wherein there's continuous dialogue, healthy dialogue around are my needs being compromised? Are my needs not being compromised? There's no, there's never an optimal solution uh, to it. Um, I think there's some general rules we can abide by. Any sort of extreme is likely, is likely um, unhealthy. <clears throat> but two, it's just more important that there's a relationship um, of tension being exercised between those two things. Because the truth is, uh, a pandemic is or even an epidemic is a phenomenon that puts the entire society at risk. And so there's an injunction of the entire society to um, respond in a way that protects the entire society. And so in, in many ways, when we, um, and I don't want to use the word complain, but when we, when we say that our personal rights are being violated, these statements are often being made with, without due attention to the way that society serves us, right? The, 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 <laughs> very, statement, the very statement of, I want to go to the beach um, is, <clears throat> is not necessarily acknowledging the fact that there are roads that society has placed to allow you to go to that beach. There are security measures that society has created 
to allow you to get to that beach unharmed. There are hygienic or sanitary measures that society has created to allow for that beach to be safe. And, and so I think most of those statements are made with a certain level of um, uh, incomplete acknowledgement of the ways that society has, has served us. So now let me ask you, I think the biggest question, which is what do you think is going to happen? Are we going to go back to the same old situation? A year from now, are we going to be exactly where we were six months ago? Or has this really changed our concepts? Has it really changed how we do business? Is there going to be long-term change? We've been talking in previous sessions about once you see the care worker as a hero, how do you go back to paying them 30,000 pounds a year? And that's, that's certainly one issue, but that's a separate issue. What I really want to know is, do you think this is going to change society or a year from now is it going to be exactly where it was a year ago? Uh, well, may, maybe just the U.S. stock market, <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is seeming to withstand the test of COVID. Um, uh, no, I, I don't think we're going to go back to being the same. I think it's impossible for us to go back to being the same. We've gone through a major societal trauma. Um, we're effectively going to go through a PTSD. Um, I, you know, it's, it's like they say a mind once stretched never goes back to its original dimensions. And I uh, think I actually heard uh, that in Oxford. Um, a societal mind once stretched never goes back to its original dimensions. So we're going to be uh, changed. Um, and it's not for the better or the worse. It, it will be for the better and the worse. Um, you know, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be, there will be positive aspects to the change. We're having greater dialogue around mental um, illness. We're having greater dialogue around social determinants of health. We're having greater levels of respect and appreciation for our healthcare workforce. And there'll be negative aspects of change. Maybe it is that there will be a greater level of authoritarianism. Uh, maybe it is that there will be greater levels of inequality with the economic engine not running the way it should. But I, I do think that we are going to reset um, to, we're, we're, we're going to either reset or be resetted. <laughs> um, and, and the onus is on us to be um, proactive in shaping what the future looks like. Um, and I think leaders are called on in a way that um, leaders have never been called on in the past hundred years, which says a lot for the burden that they bear. Um, and as, as the global citizenry, our job is really to, end, to, to realize that our actions really do affect our neighbors. <clears throat> and when we're seeking to form, formulate our thoughts and perspectives on these different issues that arrive, it's important to keep a certain level of balanced, multidimensional perspective. I think that's a great answer, and I would very much like to see something like that happen. I think it's going to happen, personally. I think our, our attitudes have changed. I think we can't look at each other the same way anymore. And I think that's going to change a lot of things. So, so I just want to thank David um, for your excellent <laughs> contributions both in fact and to this forum and thank all of the readers and the viewers and say good night thank, thank you, you.